So yesterday we uh, talked about pricing and uh, now we want to make another distinction and uh, continue on to a, a second uh, topic in pricing. So yesterday we talked only about what we might call cash prices or what in finance would be called spot prices. We were just talking about the, the immediate actual uh, trade price of goods and factors of production. And, and of course, you did this for money as well. Uh, in the market, you know, what's what's the actual exchange value of the things that we're buying on the spot in in the market? So you go to a restaurant and you you pay for lunch and that's the spot price or the cash price The transaction is completed right there. There's no there's no uh, Temporal dimension to it, right? There's no time dimension. You're just taking the money and paying and you're getting the service or the good so those are the prices that we've talked about uh, so far. And the same is true of money. If we want to talk about money's price, it too has a spot price, so to speak. It has exchange value right now for buying things. <clears throat> but then there, uh, there are prices that have a time dimension to them. And that's what we want to talk about now. Uh, what about prices that uh, where uh, there isn't a synchronous element to the trade of money and goods? What if, what if one part of the trade is done earlier uh, com uh, as opposed to another part of the trade? Or what if, what, if we're, uh, what if people are agreeing to make trades today at some future date at a price they agree upon today, forward prices? Right? What about those? So that's what we want to uh, delve into in this uh, session. <clears throat> uh, and we'll proceed in three steps, uh, very similar to what we did on Monday. We'll talk first about some fundamental things. Uh, with respect to human action, what, what do we know uh, just by reflecting on who we are as human beings about the time element in action? We'll start there. And then we'll talk about the two valuations that uh, are made by people with respect to time concerning their actions. Right? And, and then we'll get to forward prices and then the rate of interest. We won't spend much time with forward prices, but we, we want to make distinctions, right? We want to see the principles and then make the proper distinctions. Uh, and, then, and then the third thing we'll do, of course, is uh, uh, give an explication of the, of the uh, uh, theory of interest. We'll uh, lay out the explanation for uh, interest rates. <clears throat> and we'll try to deal with some of the nuances uh, that are involved in this uh, at the end. So, so we're you know, proceeding from the basic to the more uh, complex uh, elements of this. <clears throat> OK. so. The basic uh, principle uh, with respect to uh, the time element in human action is that the different moments in time that we experience as human beings are not homogeneous with respect to our actions. The different moments in time have different conditions for action, at least potentially, different conditions for action that are more or less conducive to the success of our actions. We, so, so when we're thinking about the time element in action, we're, we have to take into account the fact that today the conditions for the success of a particular action may be different from uh, the conditions for the success of that action next week. Or you know, right now the conditions for the success of an action might be different from an hour from now and so on. So even though we have a kind of technical notion of time, right, where the clock is just ticking away, <clears throat> uh, with respect to action, uh, we actually have a different experience of time as human beings. So that's one element of it. The other uh, feature of action with respect to time that we take account of in, in our actions is just the distinction between sooner and later. As soon as I say that, hopefully it clicks in your mind that, yeah, there's a difference between uh, getting a satisfaction sooner and getting the, the satisfaction later, uh, regardless of the, of the time element, right? Regardless of the clicking talk, uh, clock time, if we just think about this in the abstract, uh, there's a difference between sooner and later for our actions. And so these are the two basic elements. <clears throat> Now, uh, let, me, let me provide one, one further uh, thing that we know uh, sort of fundamentally about uh, time in action, and then we'll proceed to the 
particular things that we need in order to build our analysis. And this is that we all uh, realize uh, that action involves a sequence through time of particular steps that we take. And this is uh, what Dr. Rittenauer discussed yesterday in talking about the capital structure. He'll talk more about that today, but about uh, the division of labor, right, in the capital structure. And think about um, um, uh, any particular uh, action, like uh, on Monday we talked about uh, having a smartphone. But in order to produce a smartphone, we had to first extract certain raw materials out of nature and then work on them to produce components of the phone and then take the components and assemble the phone and then you know, ship it to the, to the consumer who can use it as a consumer good. So, so all of the goods that we uh, uh, use in action follow this same kind of process, right? We, we take labor, we extract a raw material out of nature, we use it to produce some uh, capital good, <clears throat> and then with, in combination with other capital goods that we produce in a similar way, we eventually reach the attainment of the end, which is to have the consumer good to act and satisfy our preferences. So there, this time element that exists in action is always present. The, the start of the action is always sooner than the satisfaction of the end that we attain through that action. Right? <clears throat> okay, now we wanna deal in particular though with uh, th this particular element which uh, Ludwig von Mises calls the duration of action. This is the key to understanding the, the two principles of valuation that I've, I mentioned already. <clears throat> and the duration of action uh, can be defined in the following way. Every action has a duration, it has a start. And therefore there's a time before the action occurs. And then we choose the start of the action. And then the action has this duration, this period of time over which the action is uh, uh, processed in motion by the, by the actor. <clears throat> and then the action has an end point. So there's a time before the action, there's a duration of the action, and then there's a time after the action. And the basic point that uh, I mentioned already is that when we start an action and when we end an action is a choice variable for us. How do we decide when to start an action and when to stop it? And the answer is we, we decide according to our preferences. We, 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 this is a, a decision that we make with respect to how we value the attainment of the end in the action. <clears throat> so this is the first, uh, the first step. And then the second thing to point out about the duration of an action is that the duration of action, because it involves production and consumption, we can subdivide the duration of the action into those two component parts, right? Two uh, time elements. There's a period of production. Like again, let's say we wanna produce an automobile, then we'd start the action by mining iron out of the ground and extracting rubber out of rubber trees and so on and so forth. And then we'd produce the body, uh, you know, steel and then the body fenders for the car. and we'd take the uh, raw rubber out of the trees and we'd make uh, tires for the car and so on and so forth. Then we would assemble the car. And so there's this period of production. <clears throat> and uh, the period of production, of course, could vary. We, we could have different technologies which, which would allow a variation of the period of production. It's a choice variable to decide. Do we want a period of production this long? Or do we want a shorter period of production? Or you know, what would happen to the output if we shortened the period of production or lengthen it out? Um, there are automobile companies, for example, still today that hand make uh, automobile, hand make uh, uh, the assembly process. And this uh, undoubtedly takes longer than doing it on the assembly line, right? So why do they do this? Well, well, they think it's more valuable. They think they have customers who, who, would, who would like the greater uh, quality or, or whatever uh, difference in the output exists from engaging in this longer production process. It's a choice variable <clears throat> for us. And you can see that there, within, there could be even subcomponents within the period of production. The working time that I've just mentioned is the stages of production. Right? Mining iron, producing steel, making fenders for a car, producing the car. That's the, the stages of production. But there also might be <clears throat> instances of maturing time. For example, the car, uh, the body uh, panels of the car have to be painted. 
And in um, you know, modern factories, auto factories, they have you know, equipment, automatic uh, computer equipment that sprays the paint or however it's done under the, onto the body panels. <clears throat> but the paint has to cure. You have to, sit, you have to wait for a period of time. It's just doing nothing. You're just sitting there waiting for the, for the, to take the next step, right, for the paint to cure. So sometimes there's maturing time when, when you know, the process that we've undertaken has to come to fruition. Um, and, uh, this, this may not always be the case, but there are certainly examples of such uh, instances, right? And so that has to be taken into account. Can we adjust that? Can that you know, is it, do, do we have different technologies which will allow us to have longer or shorter maturing times? <clears throat> or, and does the maturing time make a difference to the value that we place upon the, on the end product? Uh, and then the consumption part of uh, the duration of action is, is what Mises calls the duration of serviceableness of the good. So once we produce the good, we can use it over and over again, at least in principle. Some goods, of course, are perishable, right, like food. And, but there are other goods that are durable. And even, even sometimes food can be somewhat durable, right? You can buy a large pizza and eat half of it. And, and uh, refrigerate the other half and so on, right? It's a choice variable. We, we, this is the point. We choose according to how we value uh, the, the different options uh, uh, available to us. <clears throat> and so there's a duration of serviceableness. You could build a car that has a, a lifespan of 20 years. You could build a car that has a lifespan of five years. Uh, you choose between it, uh, these options according to the way that you value. You know, if you build a, a cheaply constructed car, uh, then maybe you could get a lower price. And if you build a, a, you know, a more durable car, you'd pay a higher price and you know, extend the life. And, and then you can extend the life of the car, right? Do maintenance and so on, right? This is how we think about, uh, or conceptually, this is a good framework for how we think about our action. There's a duration of serviceableness um, uh, of the good. <clears throat> okay, so now with this is background, we can address the, these two ways that I mentioned already of valuing um, uh, our actions with respect to time. <clears throat> and the first, to have a, no, a name for this, um, Joe Salerno has suggested, and, and uh, this is, I think, a very apt name. He's called this the time schedule. This is referring to the timing of action. When, when do we start the action? When do we stop it? Will the action have more value to us if we do it today or tomorrow or next week or two years from now or uh, so on and so forth? So this is the idea. We have a timeline uh, from the left to the right. Time is just passing on, right? This is maybe uh, you know eight o'clock in the morning today at the left side, and six o'clock in the evening today at the right side. Or this is <clears throat> 2022 on the left side and uh, 2025 on the right hand side, right? It depends on our action, how we're thinking about the time frame of it, and and we're choosing where to place our action in, in this stream of time. That we can do, right? <clears throat> and uh, as Mises likes to put it, he, he has these uh, felicitous uh, phrases in uh, human action where he says, time is an irreversible flux. Time, that is to say, each moment is uh, different <clears throat> with respect to the uh, application of action, the success of the action that we would take in different moments of time. It's not that in moments of time are not interchangeable. They pass by in a certain order, and this order has to do with their uh, uh, ability, the, the circumstances in that moment, uh, the ability of those circumstances to be conducive to the success of our action. <clears throat> and so this is, the, uh, uh, th this is the time schedule then. We're going to choose when to schedule an action with respect to its suitability uh, or achievement of the action within the, within the frame of time when it's appropriate, when we deem it appropriate to engage in the action. So this is the idea. <clears throat> we could put this uh, then in, in uh, terms that we used uh, on Monday. We can talk about uh, economizing our action with respect to time. And here we see the principle is since time is just passing by, it's this irreversible flux that just moves, right? We can't do anything about that. That's what it means to be a temporal being. We're in the stream of time, and it's simply, it's simply moving forward. 
and, and therefore we can't we can't allocate time in the way that we allocate our labor or we allocate uh, you know our our money to different ends. We we simply can't do it. We we can't accumulate time and then apply it to a particular end, right? We don't you know accumulate a day and then apply it to an end like we accumulate uh, money and then use it to buy a good. But we can economize our action with respect to time. We, we, we can choose when to, when to take an action with respect to what we think the value of the action will be if we take it at that moment in time as opposed to another. Um, just to give you a, a mundane example of this, well, it's not mundane to me, but this is kind of a mundane example. My wife's birthday is August 18th. And so if we're, you know, let's say I uh, uh, take her to a nice dinner at a nice restaurant in Pittsburgh, uh, Pennsylvania. <clears throat> well, it would have more value to us if I do it on her birthday. If I, if I did it on September 1st, you know, that would not have the same value uh, to, to us as if uh, I do it on, on, on her birthday. That's what we're talking about. There's a timing, right? We can, we can economize that action by taking it at, on the day that we think it would be the most valuable to us. And, it, and then that's a general principle that uh, is, is at least uh, possible for us to do with any action. Again, maybe, some, maybe sometimes we're engaged in an action where it's incidental as to when we take it, and we don't pay much attention to this. But in principle, this is always in play, right? That's the point. Now, if it's true, if, so far as we've said, if, that, if this is true, then it would also be the case that uh, goods would have different value. The same good would have a different value at different moments in time, at least potentially, because the good is just uh, getting its value imputed to it from the value of the consumptive end that it's satisfying. So here, let me switch examples just to, again to use a kind of mundane example for this. Uh, people are often... Uh, uh, doing things like, uh, especially nowadays, doing things like uh, trying to be more self-sufficient in their food production. So we have, uh, we have friends from a church who uh, live on a farm, and they, they, they're like 90% uh, self-sufficient. They grow 90% of their own food. <clears throat> and one of the things they do, of course, uh, to, in order to accomplish this, it, since the seasons, the, you know, the production seasons don't correspond to the consumption uh, patterns is they uh, they uh, pr uh, find ways of storing what they produce, so they'll they'll uh, produce something and then can it or right or preserve it somehow, freeze it or you know they'll uh, they'll butcher a cow and then freeze the meat, <clears throat> and then they'll eat you know the meat over the winter. They'll thaw it out and eat the meat. And and uh, okay, so the 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 point of that example is that. If they butcher a cow and they've got uh, whatever a hundred pounds of meat, the marginal utility of you know a pound of hamburger at that point to them is very low, right? Because they have so they, their stock of meat is very large, but the marginal utility that they would anticipate for that pound of hamburger in uh, in the cold winter days of February is very high, and so what they want to do is transfer the consumption. Of the, they want to store the meat in a way that they can transfer the consumption of the good to where the value of the good is greater. And so that's what they're doing, right? And again, this in principle could be done in, in uh, actions, uh, you, you know, uh, more broadly speaking. <clears throat> uh, so so we're, the good itself then can be allocated, not, not just the action, right, but the good itself could be allocated with respect to the differing value at different moments in time that are anticipated by people. And this is where we get then to uh, forward prices. So let me switch my example again to a market case because pricing is a phenomenon of the market. and We've just been talking about the personal economy in my examples. <clears throat> uh, let's say we look at oil markets. So there's spot prices for oil and there are forward prices for oil. And forward prices come into existence, as it says on the slide, when people today who are, are buying and selling oil, right there, uh, it's an oil producer and a refinery company uh, entrepreneur. <clears throat> so the uh, uh, producing company's selling and the refining company's buying the oil and then right, uh, using it as an input to produce gasoline and other consumable products. Uh, so, they could, uh, so the refining company could 
and the oil producing company could agree on spot transactions, cash transactions today, but they could also agree on uh, a trade in the future at some date in the future. And that would be a, or at least a one instance of this would be a forward transaction where the two parties simply make an agreement. They don't, they don't trade anything today. They just make an agreement to trade uh, the good at a price they stipulate today at some date in the future. So they say six months from now, I, uh, the uh, oil producing company will sell 10,000 barrels of oil to the oil refining company at a price of $90 a barrel. They make that agreement today. That price is called a forward price. And forward prices are the source of all derivative contracts, which we won't talk about, it's a more advanced topic. The point is, suppose, suppose then that people are making forward uh, uh, contracts, the, these oil uh, traders are making forward contracts, and the, price, uh, the forward contract price is $200 a barrel, six months from today, and the spot price today is $100 a barrel. Well, then th this provides economic calculation possibilities, right? Profit po possibilities for arbitraging that is transferring the oil from the present moment in into the future. So if, 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 I, you know, if I'm an oil producing company, I've got a big uh, uh, storage facility and I can sell the uh, barrel of oil for $100 right now, or six months from now, I can get somebody to agree to pay uh, $200 a barrel, I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna sell forward, right? So as the supply of forward uh, traded oil increases, the forward price would fall, and as the supply is restricted from being sold in the spot market, the spot price would rise until those two prices came roughly together. This is how the market works, right? This, is the, this, is, this improves the allocation of the good because the good is anticipated to be more valuable in the future. We, we need to uh, conserve it now and transfer its use to the future. This is what markets are doing, uh, forward markets are doing, right? Okay, well, having gone through that, we uh, will leave that uh, issue <laughs> behind. Since again, our main task is to talk not about forward transactions and forward prices, but about the interest rate. And so uh, the, part of my reason for going over forward prices is to clearly show you that interest rates are different. They're, they're, they're based upon an entirely different element of time in action, this second element of time that we mentioned about sooner and later. They have, they have nothing per se to do with forward prices. That is with the timing schedule of things. They have to do only with sooner and later. And we'll see why as we go through this discussion. <clears throat> okay, so this is the ne next step, right? We wanna move now to the second way in which we value action with respect to time. And uh, here we're, we're concerned with this uh, duration. We're concerned with the sooner and later aspects of the duration of a particular action. <clears throat> so now what we're saying is, suppose that we have action already uh, set in the proper time schedule. So this action that I'm displaying on the slide is already being taken or placed in the time frame that the actor thinks is most uh, economizing. So we've taken that problem off the table. We're not talking about that anymore. We're saying, suppose the action is already placed in the proper time to get the most value. Then wh what about the duration of the action? Wh what about the start and the finish of the action, right? <clears throat> and the answer to this question is that people will always prefer to start the duration of serviceableness, that, that is the satisfaction that they get from the action sooner that principle is called time preference. So there's a time schedule in action. How do I time my action? When do I decide to take an action? There's time preference. For any action that I've decided to take at the best time, there's a period of production and there's a duration of serviceableness. And people always prefer to shrink the period of production. In the abstract, you always prefer to have a shorter period of production. You always prefer, in other words, to start the consumption, the satisfaction of the uh, action 
closer to the start of the action. Notice it might be that a person has economized this action by saying, I want the duration of serviceableness to start here. I want to have the consumer good on Friday. They say that. Why Friday? Well, because th that's what they think is the most valuable point at which to have the, have the uh, duration of serviceableness of the good in their hands, right, using it for consumption, as opposed to uh, next Monday or you know, a month from now or whatever. Then time preference would say they, they would, everyone, a person would always prefer to have the start of the action move to the right. They prefer to shrink the period of production, right? They, you know, if it costs them, um, in, the, in the production process, if it costs $1,000 to uh, produce the good, and the production starts uh, a week ago, and then you produce the good, right, and, it, and deliver it to the consumer on Friday this, of this week, it would, be, it would be way preferable for the producer not to expend the $1,000 two weeks prior, but only one week prior, right? It would be even better if you could expend the $1,000 just a, a, a minute before delivering the good. That would be even better. That's what time preference says. That's the principle of time preference. <clears throat> uh, Mises, again, has a very felicitous phrase that he uses for this. He says, Time preference means that there is disutility in waiting. There's a disutility in starting an, uh, the production and having to wait until the good is produced so that you can get the satisfaction of the consumer good. That, that people don't want this. They, they want to shrink this. This is uh, uh, a, 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 a aspect of action that they want to minimize. Now, whether or not a person can minimize the, the period of production, we've already pointed out, de depends upon the technological possibilities, de depends upon the conditions of their environment, right? Whether there are alternatives which would allow them to shrink the period of production. This is an open question. What time preference is saying is that people would always prefer the shortest, most productive production process possible. That, that's what it's saying, right? They, they prefer to shrink the period of production. <clears throat> uh, okay. Uh, so that's, that's the basic idea. <clears throat> now, sometimes you'll see the definition this way. And so, once again, it, uh, there's a lot of terminological, um, I'll, call, I'll say ambiguity, a lot of terminological nuance and difficulty in all of the language that's used in this field. But sometimes you'll see the definition written this way. Uh, that a satisfaction is preferred sooner as opposed to later. A given satisfaction, right, is always preferred sooner. Now, that, that's not quite as uh, crystal clear as Mises' notion of the disutility of waiting. <clears throat> but it's a shorthand, right? A given satisfaction is always preferred sooner. From the start of the action, it's always preferred sooner as opposed to later. Uh, the other thing to emphasize here, oh, I, uh, by the way, you would also see another phrase, which I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about uh, <laughs> uh, anymore. I don't even have it on the slide. Uh, I just want to mention it in passing. Uh, sometimes you'll see the phrase, present goods are preferred to future goods of, you know, the same goods, right? Present goods are per, per, uh, preferred to those goods in the future. And that's the worst way to say this. That's the most ambiguous way to to give a definition of time preference. <clears throat> but you can see why that would be so. You'd see the sense of that, right? <clears throat> uh, but in any case, we won't, I'm, I'm setting that aside. Maybe if, uh, we can uh, have a discussion later if you're interested in, in all of that. The thing I want to emphasize here is that time preference is a logical necessity of human action because we're temporal beings. When we talk about the existence of time preference, we're not talking about psychology. We're not talking about uh, physiological needs or things like this. Physiological conditions of the human body or psychological conditions of the human mind could, could alter a, a person's rate of time preference. It could, it could make them more desirous of having present gratification or less desirous. <clears throat> but, uh, but it doesn't create, it's not the origin of time preference. Time preference originates because we're temporal beings just like scarcity originates because we're finite beings. It's not, it's not that this is a psychological condition you know, that we could overcome if we, just, if we just put our minds to it or something. 
<clears throat> uh, okay, so this is the definition. Now there are a few implications that we want to highlight and then we can get to the last uh, topic which is the <clears throat> explanation of the rate of interest. First, as we've uh, alluded to this already, uh, time preferences that people have will determine the economizing intertemporal allocation of their production and consumption. <clears throat> so here's the terminology. If people have low time preference, this means that their intensity of desire for sooner satisfaction is less. And if people have high time preference, we're referring to people whose intensity for sooner satisfaction is more intense, more, greater. So you can see that if, it, with this terminology, you can see that if people have lower time preferences, then they're going to be more willing to commit to longer production processes because, because they're, they're less urgently desiring the, the beginning of the duration of serviceableness. They're more willing to save and invest and, and, and to extend production processes uh, out in time, intertemporally. How far they extend production processes dep depends upon their rate of time preference, how high and low a person's time preferences happen to be. And remember what, what economic analysis is showing us is that each, each of us as individuals will have our own personal time preference. And then when we integrate our, our personal economies in the market, um, the market will collaborate all of our, right, we'll be able to integrate all of our uh, personal economies and we'll get market prices as a result. So we get a kind of social result from the integration of our personal economies in, in prices of consumer goods, prices of the factors of production, and the interest rate. And the interest rate then will provide the, the uh, uh, necessary feature for economic calculation uh, for entrepreneurs to be able to say, oh, interest rates have gone down from lowering time preferences and now we can invest in this project. It's financially feasible now to invest in this project. Whereas before with the higher interest rate, we, it, we couldn't, we couldn't uh, justify this on the basis of the profitability of the investment or the, or the equity uh, conditions of, of the asset that we're buying. So this is, the, this is the principle. And then what we want to show, the main thing we want to show, of course, is that t uh, time preferences determine what we'll call the pure rate of interest. I mentioned already uh, there's some nuances involved in all of this that we'll hopefully get to at the end. But we're just talking about the rate of interest that would emerge on a market if the only factor that influenced interest rates was time preference. This is what Rothbard calls the pure rate of interest. So we'll deal with that first, and then, again, if we get to the uh, material at the end, we'll, we'll add the nuances on. The other, there are other causal factors that would enter into uh, any particular market rate of interest. <clears throat> but the pure rate of interest is always, um, is always uh, expressed as a trade of present money for future money. It's the premium that we place on present money over future money when we're engaged in an exchange, this intertemporal exchange, right? We have someone who, who lends present money. We have a borrower who, who uh, uh, obtains the present money, is demanding the present money. <clears throat> and the uh, borrower will pay a premium to the lender. The interest rate will be positive. The pure rate of interest will be positive. And the reason the pure interest rate is positive is because of time preference. Uh, the reason that uh, this, this trade is done in money and not in goods, uh, and we'll elaborate a little bit more on this uh, uh, upcoming, is because that allows it to be integrated into economic calculation. All other prices are in goods or in uh, money too, right, and not in goods. And so to have the interest rate expressed in money allows for intertemporal uh, uh, a more accurate intertemporal appraisement that uh, entrepreneurs can do. And again, we'll uh, elaborate on that particular point in a minute. So this is the way where uh, the theory, our explanation runs out for the theory of interest. So the top uh, row of this uh, slide, I've, I've just reproduced what we talked about on Monday for consumer goods, right? If we have consumer goods, we just have people's preferences we have some uh, reverse preferences between the buyer and the seller, right? The buyer prefers the good relative to the money price offer. Um, the, uh, uh, the seller prefers receive the money and give up the good. And then we have a market with lots of people and the uh, uh, price uh, emerges in this market to where, where uh, the market clears so that everyone who wants to buy can find a seller and everyone who wants to sell can find a buyer. And so we get the maximum degree of 
economizing movement of goods and satisfaction among people uh, in the market. We get the prices of consumer goods. So the interest rate, the pure rate of interest, emerges in the same way. We have people with different preferences, uh, uh, time preferences. We have some people with lower time preference, some people with higher time preference. They can meet and uh, find this out, and then uh, they can negotiate a uh, mutually advantageous exchange for lending and borrowing, and that uh, rate of interest uh, would emerge. Again, we're just dealing with this pure rate of interest. That rate of interest would emerge through their negotiation about uh, what they would find acceptable. And, I will, and I'll give an example here in a minute. And so, that, so it's the same, exact same logic, right? There isn't any difference here. Uh, we don't need a separate way of thinking about the interest rate in order to explain it. <clears throat> Now, let's get to this question that I mentioned about the money uh, being used in, uh, uh, in the uh, trade. <clears throat> so if, if people tried to make loans in goods, let's say they made loans in uh, men's dress shoes or uh, bags of apples or something of the sort and not money, then they would... The, the result of the uh, market value in the future of the goods would have two components to it, right? It would have the, this rate of interest that people are trying to obtain, and it would have this timing element, right? It would have this, this uh, difference, let's say, in a bag of apples if uh, suddenly uh, people come to believe that uh, all the apples are tainted and and uh, the demand, uh, you know, six months from now falls to zero. <clears throat> but money uh, doesn't face the different conditions of consumption and production, right? Money is just the medium of exchange. And as long as money continues to perform as the medium of exchange, well, then it, it can't suffer from the vagaries of different demands of, uh, you know, for consumer goods or producer goods, which makes it more suitable for lending and borrowing. It, it, it isolates the, the uh, lenders and the borrowers from the vagaries of the different demands for goods that, that are occurring over time. <clears throat> or to put it as I did before, and, and again, we want to show this more uh, strictly, money performs the, a function of economic calculation for all different dimensions in which economic calculation is relevant. Money provides economic calculation across persons, regardless of their preferences for things, across geographic locations, across space, um, and across all goods, right? And also across time. So it's an integrated system of economic calculation. That's why money is used in uh, 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 b lending and borrowing. Now let's go to the, some of the details of this. So here's just a simple case, just like we did on Monday, of a simple case of the trade of uh, consumer good, where we can have a mutually advantageous trade between two persons who have different preferences for, um, uh, different time preferences, preferences intertemporally for money. So the person on the left, person A, has lower time preference than person B. Person A's premium uh, or time preference uh, interest rate uh, would be, uh, a minimum of 10%, right? Person, person A is willing to, to give up $1,000 in today to get $1,100 in one year. So the premium that they place upon $1,000 today is $100. <clears throat> That's the minimum that they're willing to give up uh, in, order, you know, in order to trade away the 1,000 in the present to get uh, $1,100 in a year. But person B has higher time preference. Person B's premium is $300, person B would only lend $1,000 today if someone were to offer $300 as a premium. And uh, therefore, person B could make an offer to borrow from person A at uh, any interest rate of 29% or below. So $1,290 would be the maximum buying price for obtaining present money from person B, and $1,100 is the minimum selling price for person A to lend. So they could find a mutually advantageous inter pure interest rate somewhere between 10% and 29%. It's just a matter of them negotiating you, you know, the, an interest rate, right? So that's where the pure rate of interest comes from. It comes from disconsideration. 
Uh, then we have a market. So again, this is no different than our discussion of consumer goods prices on Monday. And uh, what we're depicting on the market, remember, is point A, we're just looking at the empirical evidence. We're just looking out into a market, and we're seeing the rate of interest on, on some uh, instrument, financial instrument, and the amount traded. We're just looking at that, and we're saying, why is it that the interest rate on that financial instrument on this day at this, under these conditions happens to be 2%. Why isn't it 5% or why isn't it 1%? And the answer is if it were 5% under the conditions on, under which it occurs, if it were 5%, there would be excess supply of loan of, of a credit, right? Or funds, present money lent. There, there, would be, there would be more people coming into the market to lend, but there would be fewer people who would want to borrow at that higher rate of interest. And so that interest rate never occurs, right? The demand and supply curves, remember, are just conceptual tools of analysis. The real data is just a, is just a single intersection point. And in like manner, the interest rate can't be below that because there'd be excess demand. There'd be uh, borrowers at that low interest rate who couldn't find lenders. And therefore, they would just bid up the interest rate to, to be able to, the, the ones that are more eager would bid up the interest rate in order to borrow, right? And this is how the market is always adapting to uh, you, you know, the preferences of people to make sure or at least to um, bring about as close as possible the full mutual advantage of trade. <clears throat> so this is the uh, extending the uh, analysis to uh, the market. So we see that time preferences then determine the pure rate of interest and then the amount of present money lent and borrowed. And then just like with consumer goods, uh, the, the market, the process of the market trade will allocate the present money to the borrowers that value it the most, right? The, the borrowers that have the, mo the highest time preference, the most urgent use for present money will obtain the, uh, the loans and uh, those with less urgent uses will not. And in similar fashion, those people with lowest time preference or who are more eager to make the loans will be able to make the loans and those with higher time preference will be unable to make the, they'll be cut out of the market by the lower time preference uh, suppliers. <clears throat> now, let me give you this uh, uh, further point about why it is that um, economic calculation integrates the trade of um, uh, present money for future money, whereas it, does, it would not integrate the trade of present goods for future goods but only money for uh, present money for future money. And this is, this is just a simple uh, fact that comes from the, uh, the lending and borrowing process. So I've just reproduced a simple example where the amount of future money that a person could acquire by lending $1,000 on interest at 10% for one period is $1,100. This is called compounding, right? And you do the compounding by taking the $1,000, the future value, right? You take the $1,000 and you multiply it by the term one plus the rate of interest. That gives you the principal back of 1000 and the interest payment of, uh, of $100. Then if we can just reverse the calculation, right? What, what if somebody then uh, had an agreement to be paid uh, $1,100 in a year? What would be the present value what would be the equivalent amount of present money that would accumulate into $1,100 in one year? Well, it's $1,000, right? The present value is just found by reversing the calculation, taking the future sum and dividing, that is discounting or dividing by uh, this interest rate term, one plus the rate of interest. <clears throat> so, so notice what, the, what, the, uh, what, the, what the, uh, the time market, as we call it, does is equate present money with future money. There, there's simply alternatives that, that the uh, lenders and the borrowers can have. You can have either $1,000 in your hand or you can have $1,100 in a year. They're, they're, they're equivalent, right? And therefore, the economic calculation is accurate if people are basing it upon the 10% rate of interest because that, that's the intertemporal uh, valuation that people have made in the market. So that, this is the idea. Now, the other thing we want to do is uh, quickly uh, uh, subdivide the time market just to see, again, the full extent of the argument that we're making here. So the time market for economic analysis purposes can be broken into these two uh, subcomponents. 
all the exchange of present money for future money then would either be in the credit markets, this is what we mentioned before, where the transaction that people make is not fulfilled until the future. So one party fulfills their part of the transaction sooner and another party later. So people are just making loans, right? Contract loans. So this is called the credit market. And then in the credit market, there are consumer loans and producer loans. So entrepreneurs can borrow in the, in the uh, credit markets too, and then use the money to buy producer goods. And consumers can borrow in the credit markets and use the money to buy consumer goods. Uh, but this will be integrated with the capital structure because in the capital structure, even though it's not part of the credit markets, the entrepreneurs are fronting money to the owners of the factors of production. They're paying money sooner to, the fact, to get the factors of production services. Then they're producing a good and they're selling the good and getting uh, their payoff later. Right? So there's, there's a intertemporal dimension to this. <clears throat> and they'll judge the, you know, the entrepreneurs investing in these uh, input purchases will judge the uh, suitability of the purchase, uh, not based just upon factor prices, but based upon the rate of interest. And, and so this is the key, right? Um, uh, just as a side point, neoclassical economists tend to not include the capital structure as part of their interest rate analysis, right? They have a loanable funds market where the interest rate is determined. But this, this is inadequate. This is, this is not the full story. The, the two will be, in fact, integrated that, that is to say, if we're still thinking about the pure rate of interest, there'll be a uniform pure rate of interest across the whole time market, um, regardless of what, what type of loan is being engaged in. There will be differences based on non-time preference causal factors between different loan interest rates. But there's a fundamental pure rate of interest for a given time structure, let's say one year or five years, that will be uniform. Because if, if not, you would have something like this. Suppose the pure rate of interest were low in the consumer loan market and high in the capital structure, point A in the two diagrams. Well, then the lenders would simply um, arbitrage the funds. They would simply withdraw the funds from the consumer loans, or when they're paid off, they wouldn't renew them, and they'd make loans into the, into the capital structure. And then the interest rates would come together. Right? So, so this process is continuously going on in the market. The pure rate of interest is continually um, re reasserting itself as uniform across all these different loanable activities. <clears throat> and I'll end with this, uh, uh, this other uh, element of uh, uh, how the interest rate, the pure rate of interest is, uh, uh, what impact it has on market activity. And this is to look at not the, not the big subdivisions of the time market, but to look at just different production processes. So suppose that we had this case where we had a huge difference in the rate of return, the interest rate of return, in two different uh, investable projects. Smartphones could earn 7.5% interest, and tablet investment would only earn 2.5% interest. Well, that could also could not persist, right? The capitalist entrepreneurs would then sell uh, assets out of uh, tablet investments, the specific assets in tablet investments, right? They'd sell out of these, lowering their prices, and thus increasing the interest return on those investments. And they would buy into smartphone uh, assets, and that would push those asset prices down and, uh, and uh, lower the rate of return on smartphone investment. And, and this would continue until those in investment returns came roughly together, right? The pure rate of interest. Again, and there may be other differences that cause uh, rates of return to be different, right? But we're, we're not going to get to, uh, to those particular uh, points. So the bottom line on this then is that neither physical productivity nor value productivity of assets affects the pure rate of interest. The pure rate of interest is independent from those things. The pure rate of interest is simply the discount that people place upon whatever they, uh, the entrepreneurs, whatever they anticipate the physical and value productivity of the asset to be. So if a new, um, technology comes into existence and is very productive of value, it will have a very high price, but its discounted value will still be the same as the discounted value of any other asset, right? It's the price of the asset that in, uh, embodies its physical and value productivity, not the rate of interest. Okay, thank you for your kind attention.